election of officers or any other item. So let us begin with the principal's report and then we can get Brian on his way and then we'll come back to minutes. How's that? Awesome. Okay. So we Brian, have, take it away with the uh, principal's report. Dr. Ross, before we um, before we uh, get started with that, can can I have Brian introduce his um, one of his new uh, instructional rock stars? Sure. Yes. yes. So, um, well, welcome everybody uh, to another wonderful board meeting here at TCGDC. Um, I would like to introduce you all to Miss Alice Kirk, who is our um, our new dean of academics. Uh, she comes to us with a, a wealth of experience in uh, urban education, um, going all the way from elementary school, uh, early childhood, all the way up through high school. Um, has a wealth of knowledge in the areas of, of science, math, uh, instructional curriculum. Uh, she has worked um, and still uh, works with, um, uh, what's that little company called? With the little pre-K kitties. Apple Tree Institute. Apple Tree. Oh, Apple Tree. Our early childhood. <laughs> so uh, she uh, has done things from uh, from uh, from from supporting uh, teachers as she is doing with our staff, um, uh, reviewing uh, compliance records from from school to school and making sure everybody has the things that they need. And what she has done um, just in a short time with uh, with our staff, our teachers, and our students has just been absolutely amazing. And uh, she is um, has turned into my absolute right hand in the building, and uh, appreciate all of the work that she's done. So welcome, Miss Kirk. Welcome. Good so, evening, um, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that welcome, Mr. Daniels. Hi, Kathy. How are you? I'm doing well, Alice. Nice to see nice. you. Nice to see you too. Thank you. Uh, Lise, can you share that uh, the PowerPoint, please? I don't know if all of you heard, but um, I am, I literally just arrived in North Carolina about 30 minutes ago. We are in uh, Nags Head, North Carolina. Um, I was supposed to get married a week ago um, in Florida, but obviously COVID canceled that on us. Uh, so we just, uh, we've redirected and um, got a uh, got an Airbnb, a nice uh, house here in, uh, in Nags Head. And, have the whole family here, so we're getting ready to enjoy each other for a week. So um, I come to you with um, some some information around where we are, how we're doing. Um, we're going to talk around uh, some of the the things that have happened during I Ready. We're going to talk about um, some of the instructional practices that are going on on the distance learning platform. We're going to talk about how we're we're preparing the building and uh, and selection for for students for the reentry program. That is going to uh, begin for us in uh, at the beginning of, of November. We are working through transportation, logistics, and uh, and communicating with all of the families to ensure that we are able to provide all of the supports, all of the PPE, and uh, make sure that we have uh, enough staff in the building to make sure that we are able to successfully support all of the kids that um, we need to support. So, um, if you could go to the next slide. So we started off the school year with uh, just trying to get a, a, a baseline of, of where it is that, that we are. Now we know that um, what we did at the end of last school year was we, um, we, we took a condensed version of, uh, of the diagnostic um, because kids were, were at home. They weren't able to sit for you know, a, a 20 to 30 minute assessment. And some kids who are, are just plugged in, it literally took some of them uh, three or four hours because they're just that, that focused on, on the assessment. So in the in the spring we, we took a shortened version of it and uh, and students made uh, they continued to make wonderful gains, but as we kind of anticipated uh, coming into the school year and, and kids not having access to ESY kids not having the ability to go and do the things that they normally do and then they have to turn around and have to continue back on this distance learning platform we uh, we obviously got some data that says that this is still a a struggle for our kids and um, and we will talk about that. In a, in a little bit, Ms. Kirk will give you some more insight around the um, around the testing data that we got from our kids. But the kids are really struggling um, right now on the distance learning platform. One of the good things is is that they are we know where they all are. They're they're showing up. We have contact. We're able to reach each and every um, each and every student. 
um, they are, are reaching out when they are having issues with, uh, with their distance learning platform or not being able to access the, um, the, the sites that they're supposed to be on. So um, that is definitely a good thing. But what we, we really did learn from our, our first diagnostic this year mm -hmm. is that the, um, where they are on a, from an instructional capacity is, um, is just not in a good place as we were just looking at the, the school-wide data. So uh, Lisa, could you hit the next one? So this is just a, just to give you kind of a visual without really going into, into too much detail, where we want our kids to be, and this is uh, the, the math portion of the assessment. Where we want our kids to be obviously is in those green areas. The green areas is what lets us know that kids are either uh, on grade level or a little uh, above grade level, um, which is um, you know depicted by the um, by the little the little jagged lines in the in the blue area. What we don't want to see is what we uh, actually have a visual of right now, which is all of this red that is that is scrawled across the screen. Um, we know that this is uh, a lot of this data is just due to the setting and due to the fact that that kids are are are. 100% tired of looking at computer screens and we can all empathize um, with that and then having to sit for like I said a 20 30 uh, sometimes even a 40 minute assessment is very difficult for kids to do especially when there are multiple people that are around them uh, whether it's other siblings that are you know in the room with them uh, on their distance learning platform mom and dad may be working or whatever the case may be but um, we are we have a, a huge lift um, ahead of us to, um, to really close this, um, this gap that we now have, um, that we had really done a good job of, of closing uh, as we were closing out last school year. But um, we kind of anticipated this. Even a lot of this data is, uh, is even around uh, new students that have, uh, that have come to our building. So we are dissecting all of this data. We are using this data to help us determine who the um, who the red zone kids are from an instructional standpoint. We've targeted them for, um, for re-entry into the, the first cohort. So we are um, making sure that we are able to, to help the students that actually need it uh, the most. Uh, can you click to the next slide, please, Elisa? And so um, in the area of, of reading, um, it's, a, it's a little better uh, in that you see a little bit more green on, on this section than you did in the, in the previous area uh, of math. Um, that really just goes to show how how strong I think our, our staff have been doing with the uh, with the literacy programs and where we were when we closed out the school year and had to uh, had to leave in March due to the uh, to the pandemic. Um, we really had our kids on an upbeat and, um, and and on structured programs around uh, reading independently, uh, guided reading that was happening inside of the school um, and, and writing programs that that were happening uh, on a regular basis. Um, we are going to continue to use uh, those three pillars as we continue to, to work on a distance learning platform and as we're bringing them back into the school uh, for the, for the re-entry portion of the, uh, the school year that's getting ready to happen. Um, are there any questions just around the visuals that you've seen before we go into, into a little bit more depth around the, uh, the iReady detail? Brian, this is Marie. Just a quick question or maybe a little bit of context to help me since I'm new. Um, obviously, kindergartners would be, this would be their first year with us. And I know there could be movement in student population, um, but are the seventh graders students who might have started from kindergarten or the, is that a new grade this year? Um, so our, yes, so our, our seventh and um, our seventh graders um, were, when they started, um, they were, uh, they were third graders here at the, I'm sorry, the eighth graders were third graders um, when they started. Now, what we did see, um, just to give a, a little bit of a historical context, very few of these seventh graders were, were with us in 2015. Um, we, we did not establish a, um, a, a continuum of, um, from elementary that, that we, um, we sustained all the way through until this past school year. Our eighth graders that left were a group, just this past year, were a group of, of fourth graders, and we did have a, a solid group uh, of those kids. But in, the, in our inaugural year, back in 2015, 
the majority of the kids that we lost, whether it was during the beginning of the school year or midway through all the way to the end of the school year were our kindergartners through, through third graders, which would have impacted this, uh, this group of, of middle schoolers. Most of the middle schoolers that you see that are, um, like I said, uh, you know, fifth, sixth, and um, well, sixth, seventh, and uh, and our eighth graders um, were not here at the beginning, but a lot of them have been here since uh, since 2017. So they've been with us for for a good three years. Um, now, again, the when we got them um, three years ago. Um, they came to us with a with a three to four year gap already established. So when we gave them their initial already diagnostic, um, pretty much the majority of the group uh, was in the red. Personally, I, I don't think that this this data right here is is absolutely accurate and indicative of, of who our kids are. I think it's more indicative of the of the setting that they are that they are being assessed in and. Um, and so we're we're working on that around um, creating some uh, some cycles and some structures to be able to make sure that we're able to get them uh, a little bit more uh, structured support when they're in the in the process of, of doing their assessments. Just leaving them um, in space where they're able to to pull up something else uh, on the computer that can distract them while they're in the middle of testing has really impacted their their ability to do well on this initial diagnostic. But the the, the group that is our, our seventh and eighth graders are, are prime. They're a, a really flex group and a, a fluctuating group of kids that have that have been here with us really, um, you know, three strong years. Okay. And then am I am I understanding correctly the rightmost column are the number of students. So we only have 10 kindergartners. Yes. Yeah, so we actually have 11. There's uh, there's one student that um, that didn't uh, I think that is that is new, but again, our 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 kindergarten and our and our primary grades are the ones that we are we are struggling to to attract the um the parental group, which is why Dr. Ross and I have been working with the um with the outside vendors as we're looking to get some like the the play space is an area for I mean is an area of concern right. for all potential parents because when all they see is a blacktop at our school and they're like where are my baby's gonna you know have recess and play. And all we have to show them is the blacktop. And um, as we're, you know, trying to think long term and really thinking about a, a pre-K three and a pre-K uh, four program, again, schools that have those programs are able to to start a little earlier and, and maintain their students. So we're fighting to get kids um, in at kindergarten as we because we don't offer the uh, the earlier grades that some of the other charter schools and in, uh, in the DCPS schools offer. Okay, and then I think to your point, this is our beginning of your um, assessment, and then you'll build accountability plans from this, if I understand correctly. Is that correct, though? And Absolutely. you're probably going into that next, so I'll stop asking questions. So Thank this you. Will, this will end up being uh, the baseline data that will that will dictate our instructional plan and our target goals um, for the outcome at the at the end of the school year. All right. Um, any other questions? All right, uh, Alex, I will turn it over to you. Are you on mute, Ms. Kirk, or? I am, um, so let me make sure that uh, my volume's up as well. Um, okay. Good evening, everyone. And um, just to segue right from um, that question in terms of, um, building dimension and determining approaches to measuring student learning. Uh, we've invested in um, an educational program known as Lexia for um, our K through 12. Um, it's a power up program for our middle schoolers and then our early start for um, our lower school. And this will be um, our adaptive assessment to personalize instruction um, based on data. Um, um, to be intentional and um, we know that we're faced with um, to be intentional and thoughtful in our planning um, and we um, know that we're faced with some instructional challenges um, just with this online medium so um, we want to ensure that we do have some programs that actually um, assess um, students data 
um, and students and, and where they are. And iReady is one of our baseline. And so Lexia um, will be, will be um, our next adaptive assessment um, through their literacy improvement programs uh, where the core five um, reading will support um, teachers' instructional capacity. And this is where we'll focus on developing differentiated literacy instruction for students. Um, as well as personalized instruction and prescribed students based on where we know students are. As you saw with the um, kinder group, there is some data that's an outlier. Uh, we know that there was assistance and support and parental support. Um, and so uh, and now our kinders and our kinder teachers will have to go and prescribe personalized instruction um, based on um, other assessment means um, for our students. So um, that will be their focus as we did our uh, deep dive analysis of our iReady data and um, determined determine those factors. Um, so Lexia Power Up um, will be designed, of course, to help our instructional um, and our struggling and near proficient readers. Um, as you see, we have students on the cusp. We also have students who are approaching. And so um, this will be designed to help them um, struggling and um, our proficient readers and give enrichment as well. Um, it is, um, we've gotten you know, great reviews and feedback. Lexia is one of um, the top programs um, that's being utilized across the district. And it, it really focuses on addressing um, the gaps and targeting um, fundamental literacy skills um, to increase our reading pr proficiency, which is um, one of our instructional priorities and goals um, for this school year um, as an intense intervention um, for our students um, who are struggling. Um, and then um, they have professional development for our teachers to build that professional capacity and the epi efficacy of our, of our secondary teachers um, to give the um, exact instructions, our instruction our students need to increase um, their proficiency in reading as well. Um, and then it has the data in order for us to use to um, determine next steps, um, as well as um, be thoughtful in our planning, um, as well as focus on, on um, what our, our teachers need, as well as what our um, students need um, to ensure academic success and the growth of our students. That is for literacy and then for, our, and we do have our wit and wisdom curriculum um, that provides a scope and sequence for um, literacy K through eight. And so they provide the standards in which teachers then determine the lesson objectives um, in alignment to those standards to assess performance expectations uh, for um, our literacy program. Um, the transition into um, our math program. So um, our, our, our ready data is our baseline data and it does provide um, data points and Lexia will provide more data points. Um, Eureka Math as um, we are building the efficacy of our, our, of our teachers and in, in the capacity of their instructional delivery. Um, Eureka Math is, um, provides a curriculum and scope and sequence for our students um, that is aligned with Common Core and um, it has intentional and target um, planning objectives for um, the math content for our math content teachers. Um, it has a logical uh, progression for our kindergartens through eighth, and so we see that continuing or that progressive learning uh, with our K through eight. Um, and then the implement implementation guidance and the professional development that they provide as well as the um, internal professional developments that we provide and coach up our teachers um, for the teaching and learning addresses and reduces the skill gaps um, to prepare, prepare our students to understand um, computational and advanced math. We're still focusing on project-based learning. We had a couple of, um, we had a, a, a couple of meetings with um, some project-based learning programming. Um, and so in next steps um, in planning and providing professional development as we launch our Lexia program this week and start to assess and, and gain data points. Uh, we wanna focus on, we wanna revisit 
the project-based learning um, programming um, that we discussed over the summer in our planning for our virtual teaching and learning. Um, with our inter interim um, assessment data, um, we do use the assessments from Eureka, which is a assessment. They provide an assessment um, assessment bank for teachers to use to design their own assessments um, for students as summative assessments in the unit. And they also provide formative assessments for students to inform um, learning for reteaching um, as well as to um, reteach remedial skills. And so they have those built in interim assessment, um, interim assessment um, guidance for, for teachers and the Eureka as well as the wit and wisdom. And I have it minimized here. Okay. And then for the professional development and coaching, um, just like Daniel spoke to you around the cycles um, that we're implementing uh, with our teachers, uh, we do have our literacy and our math coach um, who focuses on content area for our, our teachers. Uh, we take our deep dive analysis of all of our data uh, where teachers are sorting and analyzing the segregated data um, to inform small data group instruction, um, to plan um, reteach lessons, um, as well as to teach remedial skills, and then to enrich our students who are on grade level and also at the cusp and approaching grade level. And so um, we have our professional development, um, our professional development um, plan for our teachers where we do meet with them every Monday and Wednesday. Um, Wednesday is more content based and um, more data driven. Um, when we look at data to use um, in our approaches to um, next steps and um, intentional planning. And then on Mondays, we do focus on content areas uh, where we'll look at um, more of the um, Eureka already in the wit and wisdom um, scope and sequence and curriculum guides, the assessments and the toolbox, the online toolbox that they have for uh, teachers. Um, so we wanna make sure that teachers are proficient in what they're using. So we wanna make sure that we're providing the professional development in the training for all of the supplementary things that are available, but um, more importantly, um, all of the assessment guides and the scope and sequence and making sure that teachers are aligned with the standards of um, what's provided in the curricular um, guides of the Eureka and the Wit and Wisdom. Any questions around the um, Lexia, the program um, to Lexia. Um, I'm gonna also allow um, Kathy to, to um, speak on instructional practices and then um, transition into that next portion. Um, is there any questions around Lexia and the data and professional development coaching that we're providing? I'm not sure if this is a question specific to that, but I'm just kind of curious from a board perspective, what kind of reporting can we expect to see to understand how the baseline reporting we looked at um, at the beginning of the meeting um, matches up to the goals that are set and the progress towards those goals? That's an excellent question, Marie, thank you. And um, the iReady is designed to give a beginning of the year assessment, um, middle of the year assessment, which we'll give in January, and an end of the year assessment, which we'll give in the end of May and early June. Um, in this year's data, as anticipated, as you all have seen in media reports across the country and driving the push to get children back into school is just critically dependent um, on, on having the kids face-to-face -face with the teachers. Um, it really was, it was, it was heart wrenching to see the data, um, but at the same time, after you know we kind of took the the dagger out of our bellies, you know we realized this was what was predicted to happen, particularly for students who um, come from poverty, 
who come from environments where they've experienced trauma and um, have um, in unstable home and food um, as a part of their daily existence. And that is the students we serve. So while the data was um, very discouraging to the team, I assure you when we had uh, our meeting to unpack this, um, it was, you know, generally speaking, the team at DC is enormously upbeat and energizing and, um, you know, just a great attitude. Um, that was one of the more um, uh, challenging discussions because we've lost we, lo we had lost so much of the gains we had made with these students our last reporting uh, uh, mid-year of last year we were exceeding our um, DC charter board expectations for our uh, our charter goals which were that 50% of our students would be um, at or above grade level and we were at 60% and, um, and then COVID hit in March and our end of the year results were actually pretty favorable, similar to our mid year. But um, we were a little wary of how much help and support the children got during that because you can't monitor that assessment protocol. Um, so the point being that we need to get our children back in front of our teachers, which we are doing on November 9th, getting children back into the building um, in a hybrid learning environment for our, our most, um, our students who need it most. And, um, and then we'll give the mid-year assessment in January and we would expect to see progress. But honestly, um, our goal is to have everybody back on grade level by the end of 2022. Um, and for those of you who are following the educational environment, um, it, it seems like, wow, that seems like an unreasonable goal. Um, and it doesn't seem fast enough for, for, for our students. Um, that is a reasonable expectation. Um, and so that's, that's our goal. And um, we will continue to monitor through our school improvement planning process, how we are progressing towards that expectation. If our goal for last school year was to have at least 50%, did you say at grade level? Yes. Um, what was, I know we're not on, I know we're not there at the beginning of this school year. Um, so we certainly need to reset back to that. But what was our um, our goal? Did we have a goal with the DC Charter Board for this school year yeah, that was preset? It's the 50% goal. And that's for end of the year goals over a five year period of time. Okay. So for example, so Marie, you're new to the board. Um, we were just renewed, well, many of you are, um, our five year charter renewal, we achieved thankfully in December of 2019. Mm -hmm. So we won't be formally reviewed by the Public Charter School Board for another five years, um, which is you know, fortunate for us in this environment. Um, and, um, but obviously, you know, our goal would be to meet or exceed that goal every single year. Um, but we have you know, kind of five years to demonstrate at least movement and progress in, in achieving that goal by the end of our five year renewal period. So our goal with the DC Charter School Board is 50% at grade level, but you said our goal as a, as a school is everyone to be on grade level by 2022? That would be a very lofty goal. Um, okay. <laughs> but 50% is our goal that we have with, with DC sure. and our internal goal is 100% oh, by wait. 2022. Okay. All oh, right. wait. okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood who was with what. Yes. And you know, we had when we met sixty percent of our students um, mid-year last year, we were you know swinging from the chandeliers. I mean, that was a really impressive goal because we have to remember that fifty percent of the students that we serve have disabilities, and the nature of disability is saying you can't access the curriculum and progress at the same rates as your non-disabled peers. I mean, that's by definition what students with disabilities. The only reason they have an IEP is because they're behind. Their normal, their their similarly aged um, classmates. So we have a you know even bigger push than most schools in the district um, because of the volume of students that we serve that have student that have um, disabilities. 
but that's that's the work that we do and that we're committed to and we embrace it and and we've got a formula for success so we are we'll just implement slow and steady and as um you know miss kirk is sharing you, you know we have a strategy and it's very strategic and it's very targeted um, and it's based on on the data that we are constantly assessing and um, we just move our students step by step. But right now, honestly, we need to identify an acceleration strategy. And so we're constantly monitoring the educational landscape because I think this is a time when, you know, we'll be identifying some acceleration strategies that may not have previously been employed by um, schools. And um, I'm hopeful just because that's the nature of the person I am that we're going to identify a more effective instructional strategy than had previously been implemented um, because these children can't afford to lose out on a year of their life. It has significant fiscal uh, lifelong career and health metrics that that are impacted by it. And so it's just vitally important. And so that will be part of our work. Um, and we're constantly monitoring what's out there in the educational landscape. Or maybe we'll unpack it. <laughs> Can you say that, uh, are you really saying though, that when we say targets, a lot of our kids, because they are so far behind, there's, uh, you might be on a second grade level and maybe you're supposed to be on a sixth grade level or a fourth grade level. And so when you're talking about targets, essentially what we're doing is saying that you should be uh, achieving, whether it's uh, not necessarily growth on grade level, but growth towards grade level in other words in six months you should maybe be making eight months of uh progress is that is that the concept behind this or is it actually you're you're reading on a second grade level and uh and um, achieving your target is by the end of the school year if you should be on the fourth grade level you're actually on the fourth grade level Right. And so, Alice, please jump in here with your knowledge of iReady in terms of, you know, there's, um, we need to demonstrate a minimum of a year's growth in a year's time. And that would be the expectation of any parent sending their child to our school. Um, when your child is behind, what, what we term as stretch goals is we want to accelerate your learning such that you may be progressing a year and a half to two years of growth in a year. And that's the nature of the work that we have to do in order to catch our students up. Um, so we're always looking to help the students achieve their stretch goals, um, but at least 50% of our, our students need to meet that, that one year growth goal. And, and Marie, just to clarify, now that I'm, I haven't been spending my time as much in iReady, so now I'm correcting myself. The 50% target is that they've made that one year, one year growth, because that would be the minimum expectation of any student. Um, but we look for the stretch goals of accelerating their progress um, on the iReady assessment. Because you, you have to, you can't, if you're two years, three years behind, and our goal is only to catch you up one year, you, you never catch up, you're always behind and come middle and high school, then those gaps become, you can't overcome them because you can't get into the, the you can't pass to the next grade level um, when the stakes are higher at the high school level. So it's our responsibility as a K to eight institution to accelerate their learning such that they enter high school with the skills, the reading, the literacy and numeracy skills necessary to um, be successful in more rigorous coursework. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions about the instructional program? We certainly have a lot to do. We're not denying that. We would be, um, you know, dishonest not to say that we have a lot to do and, and to not share that how disheartening it is that 
you know, we had made so much progress with her kids last January and February. Um, and we were really on a high spot after being renewed. And we, without a doubt, you know, lost a lot of gains. Um, but we know how to do it. And once we get our kids back in front of us, I'm confident we're going to be able to, um, you know, do that, have that growth again. It will take some time, though. Okay. Well, does that conclude the principal's report? Um, we had some more information on um, staffing needs. Um, Alice, do you want me to take this? Oh, go ahead. Okay. So, um, you know, we, we really had a great uh, staffing year where we were able to end, begin the year with all positions filled, um, including some really hard to fill related services positions. Um, specifically around occupational therapy. Um, literally, we've never been able to fill that before. Um, and so we always hire from temp companies and it's just very costly to do that. And they don't become as much a part of the community that is the Children's Guild DC Public Charter School. Um, so that was a fabulous um, win for us. And um, we, we have um, a, just a need for a school speech pathologist, which really is, um, you know, probably one of our best staffing years ever. We had great retention rates and um, hired some some key new staff, including Ms. Kirk. Um, so we're we're really positioned with a very solid, committed, dedicated staff who know our families and our community and each other in a way that's enabling them to support each other and um, you know kind of manage this very um, challenging um, instructional time. Any questions about staffing or, or any of our HR challenges? All right, then uh, we'll move on to our culture and climate. And, you know, I, I, I can't wait to have some of our new board members come visit the school and to meet the staff because for, for me, um, I, I always refer to the Children's Guild DC as my like kindergarten. Like when I was a school administrator and you're having a, a bad day, you know, you go to kindergarten because the kids just jump on you and love you and show you all the love. And you're like, yes, this is why I love my job. That's what the Children's Guild DC school is for me. When I'm having a bad day, I would drive down there and they would just lift me up. And um, so the culture and climate, even in this environment, has been enormously supportive. In, and after enduring a lot of hardship, they lost a staff member last spring. They lost a student this fall. Um, just a lot of hardship. But as we say in the Children's Guild, there is no growth without struggle. And, um, the, and the, the Children's Guild DC um, public charter school team has an enormous uh, amount of resiliency and support with and for each other. Um, so me measures of school culture and climate are like attendance rates. And um, while that is certainly not where we want it to be, need it to be, expect it to be, Again, um, this environment is very challenging for many of our students in the environments in which they live with some with unstable internet connections, some with not just an appropriate place to have uh, a virtual nest, if you will, to conduct their learning, others that are being drawn by distractions in the environment in which they live. Um, and um, so we are attendance rates is something we're paying close attention to and working very hard on a day to day basis, trying to connect with our kids and families to imp improve that. And those will be some of the kids we're really looking to reengage when we open our doors on November 9th. Um, obviously, discipline referrals, which is another metric that the public charter school board measures us on, as well as attendance rates. Um, you know, there are no referrals, there's no suspensions, so these, these data points really become um, meaningless. Um, but parent concern tickets are, are important and we do very well in this area. The Public Charter School Board has a um, portal for any parents who have concerns at their charter school can submit a concern ticket at any time. Um, last year we had none and this year so far we have none. Um, our enrollment is at 293 with 50% of the students um, with disabilities, which is our average uh, and been our average enrollment. Um, but we expected 350 um, students to enroll this year. And unfortunately, we fell far short of that target. 
Um, and so we are meeting, um, I if, maybe this week or next week, I, I can't recall, um, to really talk about kind of rebranding and recasting ourselves because um, we have lost enrollment over the past um, two years. Um, that's of a concerning level. Um, and are we marketing ourselves? Are we filling a niche within the public charter school portfolio? Or is there another, um, you know, audience that we need to be reaching or marketing to? Um, so we're going to be doing some soul searching here and looking for ways to uh, increase our enrollment um, to make sure that we're fulfilling the mission of our charter. Um, we have been very publicly, I mean, actively engaged with our families, and we've held, um, you know, so far four virtual meetings with parents, like town halls, and um, to date, as well as back to school night. And there are um, town halls scheduled for the next couple of weeks as well, and that they've been well attended by our parents. Our parents are more engaged than they've ever been, which is uh, one of the positives. And um, we hope to, you know, continue that engagement once we get the children back in and, and they see how we're open and receptive to their feedback and, and, um, and established to meet their needs. So any um, questions about the culture and climate? Doesn't look like it. Okay, then I'll keep on rolling. Um, so we are planning to re-enter into a hybrid environment um, and we um, are looking to do this a little differently than some of the models that you may be familiar with in that because our students um, are have um, so many of them have special needs um, we really instead of bringing back traditional cohorts on an a day b day v day kind of approach which many school districts are doing what we did was we surveyed our families and we asked, you know, who wants to come back? And we had that core data. Then we analyzed academic data and we prioritized those kids who are really um, experiencing the greatest amount of regression. And then we looked at our attendance data and engagement data and how often children are participating and engaged in the learning. And um, we called all that to identify um, 50 students to um, come back to school on November 9th. Um, and instead of being cohorted, we're really providing what we've come, come to term as personalized learning services. So the teachers will remain teaching virtually throughout. So the, the design of this is to keep the instruction consistent and um, structured and um, the students that come back will be working in classrooms. Um, many of them just are a one off or two off with uh, a behavioral support or a clinical support or a special ed teacher or a teacher assistant supporting them and in their individualized learning needs while the teacher continues to deliver the instruction online. And the notion really was, you know, our kids come to us with a variety of learning needs, strengths, and, and areas of deficit. Um, but as we've learned from most school districts that start bringing kids back, you will have upticks, you will have cases, you will have school closures. So we made the decision early on, probably last spring, um, that, key, you know, allowing our teachers an opportunity to get really good at what is entirely a new learning system for them. Um, by consistently doing the work and getting the professional development and opportunities for growth um, would enable them to deliver more and more high quality instruction um, and disrupting that by an in and out, you're, you're in school today, now your class is quarantining for 10 days, so now you're teaching virtually again um, would be a better approach for us. And so that's the design that we're looking to implement and um, we'll have an A day, B day grouping. So you have 20 students that are on the building, 25 students on Monday and Tuesday, and another 25 on Thursday and Friday with cleaning on Wednesday and everybody operating on a virtual um, basis that day. Um, so the teaching will continue throughout on a consistent basis and the supports will be layered on on a Monday, Tuesday or Thursday, Friday. And some kids may be coming Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. 
So any questions about that? That's good. Um, I'm sorry, you might have said this and I didn't understand or, or, or listen well enough, but did you say it's a total of 50 children are going to be coming back in person, right. 25 yeah. Monday, Tuesday, and 20, a different 25 Thursday, Friday? Correct. They and those are the only ones that opted or asked to be in, or were there others who asked to be able to come back in person at some form that we weren't able to accommodate? Alice, do you know the answer to that question? Um, yes, it was um, it, it was around like 49 students and some of our measures were um, if parents were essential workers, um, the primary caregiver was um, a grandparent, um, um, our high needs at risk um, students and um, students who had truancy and um, the uh, challenges, the, the most significant challenges um, online. And so um, from, the, from that survey, um, we, uh, it was about 49 students, 50 um, that opted to come into the hybrid learning based on that criteria. But were there other parents or families who wanted their students to come back in person that weren't allowed, that we didn't have space or capacity to allow for, or is that everyone? Uh, yes, it was. And, um, uh, another determining factor um, was our considerations around transportation. Um, and, and so uh, we were considering, and, and Kathy is updating on using IC transportation, and we looked at some of the other models um, that have hybrid, that's had hybrid programs for the past three weeks, and they opted out of IC transportation um, and said that it had to be the um, responsibility of the, the parent and the family, but um, that um does not for our population of students um we don't think that that uh, we would have to provide transportation for our, our population of students um so there's a lot of considerations around uh, transportation uh, we do have parents who are um who are interested but we want to we are going to have a waiting list and so um because we looked at other models and they have waiting lists as well um so as this first way um we have we'll we'll base that waiting list um you know off of this first way of and, um re-entry students right and once we you know kind of get settled into this new environment as i'm sure you can appreciate there's there's a tremendous degree of um anxiety by both parents and frankly faculty, um, you know, coming back into this environment. And, um, you know, so we want to do it in a measured way. And it's based on the data and the needs of the family, children and families um, that we know and care for. Um, and then we can continue to add additional students in our personalized learning environments. Um, unlike, you know, the traditional cohort models that you may be seeing out there um, where, where you know as as we kind of get acclimated and we start norming the behaviors and training the kids how we're going to operate in this new normal we'll be able to continually add kids um, that need to to come in and engage with us um, and that will be our goal is to continually add kids um, as long as the public health measures are supportive of that and as you progress um, with this plan if you know, and as you get to a point where you have a wait list, is that something that you'll you'll share with us at future meetings? Absolutely. What the wait list looks like? Okay. Absolutely. Um, because I think given the time, you know, we're starting November 9th, we'll have a few weeks, then we'll have Thanksgiving break. You know, I think we can all anticipate that the public health numbers may shift at that time, and then you enter kind of the holidays. Um, and then so once we come back in January, I mean, every day is a new day. You guys are living the same world we are. Um, the, it's hard to really plan so far out in the future because things change on, on such a uh, regular basis. But we certainly keep the board updated as to as, as we um, adjust our plans and add more kids. Are there any other questions about our reentry plan? All of our classrooms are staged. Hand sanitizing stations are in place. 
PPE is in place. Mm -hmm. We have signage all over the building around one-way hallways, bathroom um, uh, limitations of capacity. We have water fountains closed off, touchless water fountains <laughs> put in place. Uh, we have social distancing markers. Um, students will be staying in the room in which they are assigned for the entire day. There'll be no mixing of, of cohorts. Uh, we'll be able to do um, contact tracing. Um, uh, we have our cleaning company that will come in each night, has um, COVID um, criteria in their contract to ensure that the building is being appropriately sanitized. We have plexiglass signs up at all our, um, our, um, our um, reception areas. There's a visitor's policy requiring all visitors to wear masks and be on appointment only. All staff and students wear masks at all time in the building. Uh, we'll try to maximize any outdoor time, um, you know, any, any outdoor learning spaces that are available, which are fairly limited in our DC school. Um, but we've we've really put in place uh, air our air handling units have have been um, reviewed and upgraded. Filters have been upgraded. We're um, you know carefully selecting rooms that have windows that can be opened. Um, so we've. We really made great effort to comply with all the expected CDC guidance um, as we enter this um, hybrid learning environment. Any other questions about our hybrid learning? It doesn't seem to appear that we have any more questions and it looks like, um, and actually Kathy, that's that's really um, just a great job of uh, making sure that you're prepared for those kids that come on in, uh, very extensive. What I think at this point, then we've finished the principal's report and we can move on to the rest of the agenda? Yes. Okay. Uh, when it comes to, um, let's see, approval of the minutes. Um, if, um, if you've had a chance, I assume everybody's had a chance to look at the minutes. Are there, uh, is there a motion to uh, approve the minutes? I motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Rob. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Hearing no discussion, uh, all in favor? Uh, signified by um, putting up your little reaction hand. I see I only see one hand. Does that mean I just need Cleo oh, where your reaction hand is? They go away. <laughs> It's too fast, those reaction hands that are up and down. Okay, if anybody is not in, in favor of the minutes, just please let me know. Okay, I don't hear anything. I guess those minutes are passed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Then when it comes to the election, the election of officers, and I know um, Michael and Marie, and I believe Angelo as well, have uh, been meeting to see if if we can um, make some progress on uh, electing a new president or having a present president to uh, put forth the chair of the board. Uh, is there anyone from that committee that has uh, anything they can share with us about uh, progress or lack of progress on on that situation? I assume. Is so Michael on the call? I don't see Michael. Yeah, I don't see Michael. Yeah. Andy, do you want to share uh, by way of update uh, what uh, Michael had shared over email with us? Actually, I did the last time. I'm not sure. Was this? 
in terms of recent emails, uh, um, and because of my uh, internet thing, I'm not sure, are we talking about how recent, like the last couple days, or are we talking about? The last couple hours. Oh, I can if I can if you if you don't have that. I just uh, no, I I did not see anything. Um, Angela, unless you wanted to jump in, I can I can sort of uh, share a little context in what Michael had sent over the email this afternoon. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think uh, at our last uh, meeting we had talked about our. Uh, informal um, ad hoc uh, little group getting that had gotten together Angelo Michael and myself um, in um, trying to move forward our uh, leadership of the board um, if you recall everyone received a survey uh, that provided all of the board officer positions um, asking everyone to share their interest in that and we talked a little bit about the survey and open it up for a little bit longer last time um, and um, as a result of that process in addition to uh, follow-up um, phone calls uh, to some of the folks um, who um, who either seemed like likely candidates um, just based on our best guess and, and, you know uh, as well as um, anyone showing interest in those surveys um, it, it, it looks like uh, Michael um, in speaking with Rob Seabrooks and Rob, I think you're on the line as well. Are you? I am. Okay. Um, I, I think I think uh, you and uh, you may have um, given us some um, expectation that you're interested in the board chair position. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think Andy in way of uh, voting and moving it forward, um, at least from this informal group that we've um, we've put together, and, and Rob's concurrence of his of his interest to throw his, his hat in the ring to be board chair, um, we would recommend nomination and voting on Rob as our board chair. Um, again, open to the board for discussion, um, and then of course. Um, I don't know that we had that information soon enough before the meeting to do anything we might have needed to have done more officially for voting. So um, I kind of defer and pass that back to you, Andy, to, to, to direct us from there, if you could. Okay, well, the, I think the, um, the one thing that would be helpful, first of all, thanks, Rob, for throwing your hat in the ring. It's very important. And um, at this point, uh, we have, uh, and again, this is uh, this is really your uh, your decision. In the uh, in the past, the way the board has operated has been that if we uh, you know we brought a nomination forward to the board and they voted uh, you know just by a, a hand vote, the uh, however. I can tell you that, you know, because you're a, a sort of a reconstituted board, a new board, you don't have to operate in that way. We, so I think the first thing is that before we uh, move forward with a vote, we should have a discussion as are you uh, comfortable with uh, just hand votes on uh, members uh, put forth before the board, or do you prefer a ballot? And I'm saying we we have it in in different ways. Some of the boards just have um, sort of hand votes at the meeting. Others, uh, we actually have a, a ballot. We send out the ballot. The ballot is then uh, sent back into the secretary, and the secretary gives us the results of the. Uh, uh, of the vote, I think so, for this for this instance, I'm comfortable with a ballot. Okay, I mean that'd be your your preference, which is pretty important given the fact <laughs> that you're you've thrown your hat in a ring. But I mean, in, in all fairness, Rob, I gotta I gotta make sure that there's a, a you know a position taken by the board. Would you prefer ballot? Yes, ballot. Okay, you would. 
How about everybody else that's on the board? Do we have a quorum to even call a vote? I'm not sure we do. I think that we have 15, four, is it four, 13 members or 15 members? We do have a quorum. We need seven. We have, okay. And we have seven? Yes. Okay. Um, so under that, um, would there anyone like to make a motion uh, regarding uh, ballot or no ballot? The, um, this is Marie. I would defer to, to Rob. If he prefers a, a ballot vote of the full board, electronically I would ask for, um, then then I, I, I would suggest maybe that's the way we should go. I, I defer to you, Rob. I'll make a motion to uh, approve um, taking the route of using a ballot, electronic ballot. Is there a second to that motion? A second. I'm sorry, who's second? So we have for the minutes. It was me, Angelo Wong. Oh, hi, Angelo. Okay, Angelo's, Angelo's second that. Um, any discussion? And, and I think. That I think I would um, also just add to that that I would um, that I think we're moving to nominate Rob as as the candidate that we would be voting on for board chair. Um, but I don't know if there were any others who had interests that didn't come out in, in our informal process here. We tried to be inclusive, um, you know, but that would be our recommendation is that Rob be the, the person on the ballot. Okay. As far as I know from the other ballots and we had no uh, we did not have uh, uh, any others who had thrown their hat in the ring for for chair. And at this point, I take a vote. Uh, all in all in favor of ballot. Would you please indicate by saying aye? You have to take aye. off your aye. Aye. All right. Looks like the eyes have it. So we will have a ballot vote and we'll instruct um, Alicia to send out ballots to uh, everyone and then return them uh, to, uh, to Alicia. And then we will uh, inform everybody of the, uh, of the vote. So I thank you, Rob. Uh, for your willingness to um, throw your hat in the ring. I, that's very important uh, because it really will begin all the other things that we need to have done. And there are a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, so we will, uh, at this point, we've, um, when it comes to election of officers, was there anything else? Uh, I think we pretty much uh, have taken care of the officer because the first officer is really the chair. And once the chair is established, then we can, it'll make it a lot easier to, uh, um, to move forward on the other positions in the board. And- um, Andy, the only other thing that I wanted to add that came out of our discussions um, it's just the um, importance that I think we've placed on, on, on a number of things that we need to move forward, but certainly the um, connectivity with the parent community and the lack of having a more structured home school association or, or PTA group. Um, and just to mention, um, I think Melody and Cleo are both on the, on the call tonight, uh, but they had expressed um, interest in um, perhaps taking some leadership in, in moving that forward, but certainly something to be discussed. And, and Rob, um, you know, should you uh, be elected the board chair, something um, I wanted to make sure you're aware of as well. Thank and you. Melody, I, I know you're on the line. I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. So if you wanted to, to jump in and, and, and add anything. Or Cleo. Melody and Cleo are still. Yeah, and I guess the only other thing that I would just add is Melody and Cleo 
um, I think within our board members are, are the parents or the um, individuals with children in the school um, as well. And I, I think all of our other board members are, are not parents of children that are, are school, um, uh, are part of the school body. And um, that uniquely positions them to, to have some, some insight and to assist our board in that. Yes, and by way of, um, you know, we also have, and you, you can kind of see how everything's kind of connected here. We have a bylaw, um, you know, when we take a look in our bylaws, one thing uh, about the, uh, the parent representatives is the parent representatives are not uh, voted on by the board in the bylaws. The ones that is the way that you get to become a parent representative and be on the board is that if the quote PTA, now we don't have a PTA, but if the, the PTA determines uh, who represents the parents and for how long, and they're the ones that actually have elections. Well, this is really what's uh, put forth in our bylaws. But when it, the, since we don't have a PTA, we don't have anybody to recommend um, uh, the parent representatives. So in that respect, we either need to fix the bylaws and create, up, create a system that would work uh, giving us parent representatives or we have to have the existing system actually operating, which means then we'd have to take, we have to work with the parents and establish uh, a parent organization so that the parents can actually fulfill that, fulfill that role. So um, one of the first things that we will need to do is to really take a look at the bylaws, discuss them, get some ideas also from Cleo and Melody about the uh, the parent association in general. So, so that's also connected to what we need to do when it comes to um, election, both of officers as well as members of the board. Um, the hybrid re-entry plan we've already uh, talked about Kathy's uh, shared that with us. Uh, annual report, I think, again, we've touched on that. Is that right, Kathy? Um, no, not really, Dr. Ross. Um, Lisa, can I share my screen real quick, please? Um, let me see. Lisa, if you can let me. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the DC Charter School Board requires an annual report each year. And um, no, that's, that's not it though, Seema. That's our kids first. Um, there are an enormous amount of reporting requirements by the DC Charter Board for all, for all the right reasons. They give us a ton they give us the money and then they hold us to a high level of accountability and one of those is an annual report that's due traditionally on September 30th this year the deadline has been extended to October 30th and it basically is a post-mortem of everything that happened the year before so our annual report that we will be submitting at the end of October on October 30th um, will reflect all the outcomes um, of essentially everything we've done from last year and they use the information from each of the annual reports in your charter renewal process every five years. So these are very high stakes um, you know, documents. They have to be verified and accurate. And um, generally speaking, you've already provided them most of this information and other varying reporting requirements, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to compile all of um, the work that we've accomplished um, in the previous year. Um, so, 
um, you know, just by way of a quick example, you know, it's, um, you know, it's purposes around performance monitoring and transparency. All these reports are posted on our website annually for the public to review any stakeholders who want to review it. Um, and, you know, kind of gives us the timeline that, that we submit, then they validate the data and, you know, kind of goes back and forth for a little while um, and then is finalized um, by the end of, of, um, of October. So there's a, a huge narrative. There's all the data that's required for reporting requirements around academic performance. Uh, attendance data, discipline data, climate survey data, parent engagement data, um, you know, and I mean, it turns out it's generally like a 90 to 100 page document. So it's very comprehensive. Um, and so then, you know, there's everything in the appendices show the staff roster, the board roster, audited financial statements, our approved budget for the upcoming year. Um, so you know, it, everything is included from our mission, describing the school program, our performance and progress um, documentation, you know, our iReady, our park scores, all of those things. This year's report um, will, will be very unique because um, most of the data from last year really became invalidated because we had like beginning of the year and middle of the year assessment data from iReady, but you didn't have your end of the year. We did, but it was done in such a different environment that Public Charter School Board has already indicated that they're not holding schools accountable for the achievement of those goals. Um, we didn't deliver PARC, you know, the annual assessment, you know, um, 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 instrument, um, um, discipline data, you know, we didn't have fourth quarter, there's no discipline data, no one's getting office referrals, no one's being suspended. Um, you know, attendance was very difficult. You know, it took us a minute to figure out how to track attendance. And then, um, so all of the last year's data um, really became moot by public charter school standards, but nevertheless, we have to provide what we have. So I just bring this to your attention um, because it's a really comprehensive report. It's very high stakes, it's very important. Um, and we're working, you know, as a collaborative team, both at the Children's Guild DC, and at the Children's Guild Alliance, um, in, as our, the educational management organization, will contribute to uh, information to the report as well. So right now we're collaborating. All the report was, all the data was due this past Monday, and now we're um, vetting it. I think, Alice, if you want to weigh in on your role with Renisha to validate the data, um, and then we'll be kind of, I'll do a final read next week to give it one voice, and then we'll submit by October 30. I don't know, Alice, if you wanna add any other nuances to that? Okay. Um, so we are updating um, this information, and um, it's, it's the same, Kathy. We, um, uh, Ms. Um, Isep has um, inputted the information, um, for attendance, for um, our enrollment, um, for our operations. And so she's um, updating that information. And then we're updating the um, academic um, part portion uh, with the coaches and um, myself um, for, the, um, for the report. Very good. And that's due to me by the 26th. I'll review it, get it in final format, and then we'll have it to DC Charter Board by the 30th. But as you can see, I'm just kind of slowly scrolling down all the, the data points. Um, they look at everything from our teacher retention rates, number of teachers we have, what their average salary is, what executive compensation, compensation is at the Children's School Guild. I mean, it, it's um, um, a very, very comprehensive um, look at the entire school. So um, I just wanted to kind of highlight that because I think it's important that the board is, is aware um, of this report and we'll certainly share it with you um, as it's complete.
Kathy, this this is Rob. Uh, real quick, you said you'd be sharing it with us as it's completed. Does that mean between the 26th and the 30th, we'd have a chance to look at it, or are you saying it would be shared after that time period? Um, I can try to get it to you before the 30th. Um, if um, I'm going to get it on the 26th, um, and you know, to read thoroughly a uh, hundred page document will take yeah. them. So, uh, has, so let me ask it this way. Has traditionally the board looked at this report before it's gone out or has it just been kind of provided after or, you know? Traditionally provided it after. Okay. Um, but if this board would prefer to see it before, then we certainly can um, um, accelerate our timeline and get that to the board. That is the will of the board. We certainly can accommodate that. Is it not true that the that the document is essentially a um, um, a report from uh, the school principal? Um, based on what's going on. And I don't know if there's much, if it's more directed um, towards organization or is it more directed towards student achievement? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a comprehensive, um, really analysis of everything that we're doing because it does speak to you know, our budget, our financial standing as an organization. Um, you know, it, it looks at like Dr. Ross's salary. You say like, are we paying our execs so much that the teachers aren't being paid equitably by way of example? I'm not saying that true. I'm just saying by way of example. Um, so, you know, it taught everything from the academic performance outcomes, attendance, um, enrollment, teacher retention, um, everything about the performance of the school that uh, they're wanting to keep track of and report out in a public forum and make transparent to our stakeholders who are providing us the resources to operate the school. So the, so in that, in that respect, I'm just wondering, um, the board, it's more or less a document that is that is prepared but it's um there it would be hard for the uh it's important for the board to know what gets sent out but it's not necessarily that the board is going to be able to monitor that document given the detail that's in there is that right well it's lagging data um right. it's lagging data so it's the it's last year's data um, I think that it's important that they that they have it, and I encourage people to analyze and understand it. Um, that said, you know, last year was unique, um, so there was a lot of missing data points by virtue of the school closure for the entire fourth quarter of last school year. Um, but at least it would give you an overview of all the elements that the DC Charter Board holds us accountable to, so you can you know, in your role as a board to hold us accountable to those same metrics over the course of the year. Is it possible to give us some, in other words, what I'm saying is, even if we give them the document, give it a hundred page document, and uh, you know, just like we give the board an audit or whatever the case is, we usually have a um, sort of like a, a summary of really what the major, um, I guess the major components of that report are. So, because I, I, you know, I'm just thinking, um, is there an opportunity to discuss it? And does it really need to be summarized in some way? Not that the, the report needs to be summarized, but I'm saying the overview of it. We certainly can provide, you know, an overview. Um, 
and I'm sorry we weren't like prepared to necessarily do that right now, but honestly, this year's report, there's so much invalidated data that it's highly unusual. We, we would, mm -hmm. We're not gonna be able to tell you, there's no way to tell you if we met any single one of the standards we're required to meet each year by DC Charter Board because the attendance data was invalidated, the discipline data was invalidated, the academic data was invalidated. The only things that weren't invalidated were, you know, our budget, but that too was impacted by the COVID closure. Um, so it's, it's a highly unusual year to, to answer that question um, because you're not gonna see um, meaningful data that you would under normal circumstances. Maybe what we do, Dr. Ross, is accelerate our timeline for producing the report that would give the board ample opportunity to review the report and weigh in if that's the will of this board. Okay, well, so we'll we'll send out we'll send out the report, and uh, I don't know is uh, uh, we can send out the report. It, it's the amount of time to actually review it. And if anybody wanted to change it, can we change it after? Suppose we find we send it out, and somebody finds something that's not accurate or whatever the case might be. Can we send in an amendment? Um, I'm sure that we could. Okay, so so I I'm just trying to make sure that there's enough time uh, for people to review it and discuss it. I guess I would just be of the mind that, I mean, all of this data is validated by the Public Charter School Board. We submit our attendance, our discipline, our academic performance throughout. Oh, the I year. see. And so there's not going to be any inaccuracies, you know, our budget, all of those things. I would, I would argue, I mean, because generally this report is due at the end of September, and it's a, it's a, it's a big heavy lift to get done while you're trying to open a school year and you can't do it all in the summer because not all the data has been made available. Um, so to accelerate like our timeline by a week or two to allow the board to review it, I mean, I'm happy to do that if the board is actually gonna review it. Um, you know, because we can we use every second of the time, I'm just being honest. Um, and I guess I would be of the position it would be more meaningful for them to understand what the components are that we're being held accountable for the charter board. And over the course of this year, be sure that you're asking us those questions. How will we do towards those metrics as we progress through this school year? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. The, but, I, but it's not up to me. I guess I'm running if the board, are you, are you comfortable in getting the report, even if you won't have enough time to maybe respond to it, and then we actually go through this uh, more or less as, a, um, as an understanding of what's, what's present. And of course, if, if you do read the report and you know you have questions about it, you can raise it, but at least I think the most important thing is is to understand what's inside, uh, what the report's all about. So when, as a board member, you really understand what an annual report means in relationship to a charter school board and what we're sending through. So if that, it, would that be acceptable that we, we uh, you know, since we're kind of time uh, dependent and um, so rather than trying to push up uh, to try to get it out early so that you would have a copy in time for you to have at least a week um, in advance to uh, to review it that we just send you the report when it's done and talk about it at the next meeting or I can give it to you when I receive it in its final format and we can be reviewing it, you know, simultaneously and any feedback you have can be provided to me during that week that I'll be reviewing it before submission. Yeah. 
maybe that's the best thing. And then in this way, you sort of have your, uh, you know, you you have both things available. If you if you want to comment on it, you have you have the opportunity, and to have the same amount of time that we would have to re uh, to review it and to respond to it. If, um, so is there any objection to that? Don't hear any objection. So let's, why don't we go with that, um, that approach. So we can expect you to be sending that to us on the 26th, is that right? Yes. And you're saying it's due on the 30th? Yes. So that means you'll be submitting it on the 30th? Yes. Okay. So I guess by the 29th, in the business on the 29th, you'd have to get uh, any comments to us, should that happen, and send them to Kathy. Works for me. Okay. Oh, one small follow-up question, I apologize if this was explained before. So with the same report, the information from here also goes to donors and others. Is it also used in some ways for topics or not necessarily? You were cutting out a little bit. Um, did, did we send support to donors and other stakeholders? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, do they have access to it? It will be posted on our website. Um, oh, so that's, um, we. Ha I don't know in the past that we've, we don't have a ton of donors, frankly. Um, but I mean, certainly it's a very transparent document and publicly available and we're happy to send it to any stakeholders who may have interest in it. That said, this, this report is unique to any other school year because so much of the data is invalidated. Unlike, you know, and that's true of every school in the, in the district and frankly, the country. Thank you. But I think that's a really relevant point because we're all kind of, we're establishing new baselines for American educational achievement across the country. So this is, this is the new baseline, interestingly enough, this school year. But we're happy to send it to whoever you'd like. You're welcome to send it to whoever you like. Once it's been sent to the DC Charter Board and, uh, and received and, and they'll validate the data um, and then they'll post it. So we should wait until that time. Not the draft that I'll be sending you. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll move on to agenda item number eight, the middle states accreditation process and timeline. All right. So um, if again, if I can share my screen, um, Lisa. So um, middle states, we're required by DC Charter Board to um, become an accredited educational institution. And so there are a number of um, um, organizations who accredit private schools, public schools, and the like. And we have selected, can you see my screen? Can everybody see that? Um, the Middle States um, Association. Um, and they're nationally highly reputable. Most school systems use them. Um, and in order to become accredited, it is a multi-year process. Um, and so the accreditation process, um, there's two phases to it. One is the candidacy process, and the second is the self-study and accreditation process. Um, in the candidacy process, you submit an interest form and then you submit a very substantive candidacy application, not unlike um, our annual report. Um, and then you ex have a, what's called a candidacy visit, which we actually had, um, gosh, when was that? Alice, was that this summer? Were you- 
I, I, well, the one that we were in um, at the beginning of the school year. School, uh, beginning of school year. Mm -hmm. So that was in end of August. We had our candidacy visit, um, which they do. In a, it's a, like a full day visit, and they do a number of things. Um, not they've reviewed your application. They do a tour of your school. They interview leadership members. They interview teachers. They talk to students. They talk to parents. And if you meet the criteria that they feel you're ready to apply for candidacy, then you're offered a candidacy. And we're pleased to announce that in September, we were offered candidacy to begin our accreditation process. So that's a, a big win. Um, and we're super proud of, of the feedback that we received. And so we're now we are in our self-study process. And so that process will take, um, it can take up to a year and a half to two years. We have selected a, a one-year self-study process, which will include a team visit, and will be visited um, obviously probably in the spring when we're hopefully more fully operational, and they can come and experience, um, you know, the real Children's Guild DC culture and climate and the learning environment that we create. Um, and then the commission will make a decision whether we're eligible for accreditation um, or not. And then we would receive our accreditation. So um, we're hoping that within the, um, by the end of the year, we've completed our self-study um, and team visit and that the commission will make their decision over the summer to achieve our accreditation by next school year. Um, the standards for accreditation really um, are around, you know, how, um, you know, the quality of your instructional programming and how we're um, building our school to grow and meet the needs um, both of our student performance and the needs of our community stakeholders. Um, there's 12 standards of accreditation. Um, that represent the building blocks that are required for a quality school and educational program. It includes everything from finances, facilities, academic programming, attendance, um, discipline, you know, just everything. It's that forensic audit again that we're constantly undergoing. Um, and it will determine what areas um, of, for curriculum or organizational capacity are, should be our priorities for growth, which obviously every school, every organization always has room to grow. So they'll identify those areas for improvement. They'll set, um, they'll have a set measurable goals and, and we'll establish a plan to achieve those goals. And so that's the self-study uh, accommodation process that we're, that we're engaging in this year. So I just thought it was important to, um, you know, share with the board um, this really important um, milestone that we're seeking to achieve this year and, and hopeful that we'll be successful. Are there any questions about um, middle states? No, that's okay. Hearing no questions, that, um, that is an important milestone no doubt about it. I know it's part of was always part of our charter agreement that we would become accredited by an accrediting body, um, such as Middle States. There's an enrollment report marketing, and since the um, this is a big issue in terms of who are we really serving? Who's our uh, who's our population? I know, Brandon, you've been thinking about that for quite some time and get a lot of response from uh, parents. So uh, would you like to um, sort of give us an idea of not only what the enrollment report is, but also what uh, uh, your take on marketing? Uh, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the new board members. Uh, Elisa, if you can share the, the document that I sent over. All right, so, so this recruitment year, uh, we had a lot of ups and downs. Um, despite the pandemic, we, we got off to a fast start, enrolling 60 students uh, at June. But right when that summertime hit, um, we, we pretty much hit a brick wall um, with the increase in the 
our ability to, to not be able to go out in the community um, with the changes in the guidelines. Um, and then the summertime within itself is it's always a, a struggle. Uh, but we rely heavily on those grassroots efforts um, and we just weren't able to do it this year. Uh, but when the smoke cleared, we ended up with uh, 293 students total. Uh, 12 of those students are non-public. Our K through eight population is uh, 281. Um, 114 of those students are self-contained. Um, we had 53 new students, which is down from the 106 students from the year before uh, and 228 returning students. So our strengths this year was our ability to retain our students. Um, we retained 80% of 85% of our remaining population. Um, our weakness this year was our ability to bring in new students, uh, which was which was it was it was the trend throughout the the district. Um, we were anticipating that students weren't going to move around a lot with the pandemic, um, and there's a lot of students in D.C. to this day that aren't going to school anywhere. It's 22,000 students that haven't uh, received attendance. Um, so we're looking to looking to improve. Uh, I think our biggest threat, Daniel's mentioned it earlier tonight, is our eighth grade population. Uh, we have 65 students in the eighth grade, um, and that's a trend each year with TCG DC. Uh, we have a pretty high middle school population, uh, not so much with our K through five. Um, and there's a lot of reasons behind that. Um, my belief is uh, we have families that identify that their student needs to go to uh, a school like ours later on in their academic career. Um, and that those things just aren't identified early on in their academic career. Uh, so we had discussed, uh, you know, K, uh, pre-K three, pre-K four. Um, we had discussed those different things. Uh, Dr. Ross, you specifically had the question where we, where, what direction are we going in our marketing? Um, I'm gonna be a part of that conversation on the 19th. I have my own ideas and my own things that I wanna to bring to the table, but uh, I think this is something that we, the solution is within the people that's on this call um, and our executive team, um, because I do believe we need to rebrand the school um, so we can attract more students. Uh, with our current population being at 293, uh, we're going to lose about 65 eighth graders. Uh, so that's going to take our population down. Um, if we retain at 85% again next year, which is, again, it's a, it's a great number to be at with retention, we're still going to need over 160 students to get us back to 350. So that's our biggest threat going into the new year is, you know, what's going to happen with this pandemic. Um, we have 65 students graduating and we need 100 and over 160 to get us back to 350. Um, I do believe uh, enrollment is going to increase once we're able to get back into the communities. Uh, as long as we're in this virtual environment, we're going to struggle. Our families respond a lot better uh, with us being face to face and being able to have uh, personal interaction with our families. Um, some upcoming important dates we are approaching the lottery in december uh, the lottery will open december the 14th and that's going to be open until march the first uh ed fest which is a, a, a pretty big event in dc is going to be virtual this year and that's on december the 12th we will be participating in our in ed fest we're currently planning for that now um, and during that time we will host five open houses one in December, two in January, and two in February, where we're making sure that we, which is something we haven't done before, but we're making sure we're, we're offering um, earlier times and later times to, to make sure we, um, we can align with family schedules. Uh, towards the end of the report, Alisa, if you, if you scroll down, uh, we put a lot of marketing efforts into our school in DC. Um, we have a $30,000 budget. We spent about uh, last quarter, we, we, well, I'm still waiting on a report to see how much we actually spent. Um, but we, 
what I planned for was $10,000. I plan to spend at least another $10,000 this quarter. Uh, but we're, we're putting money into everything from search engine optimization, our social media marketing, um, our grassroots efforts, uh, emailing and Google keyword ads. So we're doing what we, what we should be doing um, ideally in marketing, uh, but we still have to, you know, answer the, 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 we still have to figure out the equation of why that's not leading to, to new students. Um, so again, we're having a conversation on the 19th to, to discuss the rebranding of the school. Um, and from that conversation, we'll look at our marketing efforts and uh, make adjustments as necessary. Um, questions? No real questions, Brandon, from from me. But I would say that you know it's it's good to bring up. Uh, the facility upgrades, which is the last item on the agenda outside of other business, because it, it really points out the importance of what the board needs to do. As we look at our kids, I just want to, you know, just imagine if we need to get, we need to get our enrollment up. What our real problem is, uh, as Brandon has mentioned, it's really a much more of a face-to-face approach and people aren't exactly sure what our school is. So I think at this point, if it is a special education school that also has regular education students uh, or, or marketed in a way that says we're for all students, but basically um, say our parents really have we, we'd have to figure out how many of our special education students, their brothers and sisters, are also here. And if that, that seems to make sense, then we also have Ward 5, and we really don't have that many children, as far as I know, from Ward 5. So one of the things, and when you think about our facilities, we do not have a playground. Um, essentially you have a patch of cement and a fence in the back and a slanted parking lot. So, um, so one of the things that we have, if you can imagine, particularly since we need younger children, is we do not have anything that if a parent walked in here, just purely on the playground end. So, we need to make a decision about the playground because par partially what's happening is families will be, uh, as soon as they come, they can come and, and, and school is actually open, they will come and visit the school. But one of the first things they'll notice is that we do not have, uh, we, you know, our playground is essentially a patch of cement and a fence. Uh, so, um that is a key uh, a key component of a school that i mean again it should help us it won't hurt us but i'm not sure if that's enough to really move us forward we've also had our architect we talked to an architect and suggested that we really take the front of the building and the side of the building and bring the outs the inside out in terms of so one somebody could really understand what 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 that building is for because it was really designed as a government building uh, so it's kind of a plain jane from the outside um we have a nice building to our left and we have the church to our right so uh, on the one end we really need to think something about from the moment you walk, you come to the school, you kind of get a sense even when you, before you get out of the car, what it's like. Uh, what the architect suggested is that we bring in, uh, we, enjoy, we uh, involve uh, groups from the community, artists, musicians, um, people who 
are writers, poets, and uh, politicians, and people from Ward 5 to meet with us and start dreaming in a way what the outside of the building should look like. And then to really understand it. Uh, and maybe, you know, they'll talk more about what's going on in, in Ward 5. And there may also be uh, individuals who will uh, just get interested in the school uh, because they've been involved in uh, playing a role in how it looks. So that's, uh, you know, that becomes another approach. So all these things are things that we really need to talk with about the board, uh, is really the work of the board in trying to understand how are we gonna solve that problem? Because that is, that is uh, a, key, a key issue uh, to the school and to the long-term uh, health of the school and actually being able to attract younger children and maybe to even increase people's awareness that we do serve uh, children um, that have uh, special needs and that you know that could be a that could be a plus um, rather than a concern that you can't mix the two populations because you can in a regular public school and i think as far as i know i think it's even been working when we have 50 percent of the kids are special needs but i but that is a a, a key discussion that we need to have and as we're going to try to attract students uh for next year we really need that's a that's something we need to resolve um, and I think that's in a, both an exciting and challenging uh, part of being uh, on this board in a way you can contribute if we pick the right thing, do the right thing that could really last, um, well, sort of have a long-term impact uh, on the school. So that's how I'd put those two things um, together when it comes to upgrades in, uh, in the playground and gym space. <coughs> and also the outside look of the building, curb appeal. So that's, that's how those things go together. And um, is there any other business? Well, hearing none, we will have our meeting um, I think our next meeting is when, and uh, Elisa, is it, are we going every other month? Is that right? Or are we, maybe on, maybe in this situation, we may end up calling another meeting. Uh, and um, I think a lot of it depends. There's a lot of work to do in terms of just the bylaws and all these other kinds of things. Uh, there might be something uh, but I think our next meeting would not be until December. Is that right? That's correct. December 14th is the next scheduled meeting. It's every other month. Okay. So, uh, so part of this, or whether it's committee meetings, um, we may need to do something. Uh, but I, I guess the maybe first things first is we'll deal with the uh, election, see what happens there. And, um, then following that, uh, maybe we can have a pull together um, a, a work committee that says, what do we need to do between now and uh, March? And how often do we have to meet or if we can use the meetings in between as work sessions? Uh, so just think about that as we go, we go forward. So just any... Any, anyone else wanted, have anything to say, please? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. So uh, for some of the other, and this is for me to maybe do my own homework, uh, the other schools that have a similar profile, so that work with charter schools that work with special needs in maybe the same side of Ward 5, Ward 6, Ward 7, sorry, uh, just to get a sense of what some of the other schools are doing and what their layouts look like. And, 
Most yeah. of the alternative schools um, in the district um, are middle and high schools. So we're kind of a, a sole operator when it comes to being a school that's in the alternative accountability framework, um, being a K to eight school. Um, so that's a unique feature that we have. And I think what's resonating with us is what we do really well and where we meet the needs of our kids best are those students with disabilities and how we might expand our reach more broadly through the district to meet the needs of students with disabilities before they fall so far behind um, that school becomes a drudgery for them. So that's you know part of the work that we'll be doing as Brandon mentioned on the 19th um, you know, as we, um, you know, try to look at rebranding and, and uh, marketing ourselves in a different way, because what we're, what we've been doing has not been working. And then, you know, I'm just, uh, and it's only because I grew up in the, the area, I, I only ask this, and I see this at UDC a lot, they, from a marketing point of view, they, I, I don't know how they do it, but they try to get quite a bit on local radio and local TV, doing a lot of morning shows, especially I remember back to school, our president and other administrators were just all over the place and talking about the value of getting the UDC education and how it's affordable. And so they just wanted this sort of media blitz on urban radio, like other local radio stations, maybe they were even on NPR, and then also on you know Channel 7, all the typical ones. And I was wondering, have we maybe tried some of that? I don't know if it's, I don't know how it actually works to get a slot on those shows, but I was curious about it. Brandon, you wanna to speak to that? Yes, um, yes, we have, we've tried. Uh, those sources are extremely expensive um, and we haven't gotten a lot of return when we've done it in the past. Uh, so, so I think, uh, Right now, the focus should be on like who we are as a school, and once we're able to identify that, then I think the the avenues that we're currently using, um, we should be able to get uh, have a greater impact on our on our new student population. And and again, once we're able to get in the communities, um, that's it's going to have a great impact on our enrollment as well. This is Yolanda. I don't know if I missed somewhere. With what's the plan for pre-K um, or the early childhood piece? Is there? I know we had talked before about um, expanding to the younger ages. Is there a a date in mind for that? And is that taken into account with um, planning and promotion and recruiting for enrollment? Yeah, right now, um, the DC Charter Board last year during when we were approaching our renewal, um, they asked us to pause on adding any components like the pre-K to, um, to our profile because they felt like we hadn't fully met all of our um, metrics and um, they wanted us to really get really good at what we do before they approved expanding it in any way. So right now the DC Charter Board has told us they would not approve a pre-K at this time. So we need to um, you know, address the concerns that they had raised, which obviously were set back all the more by the pandemic um, before we reapproach them about preschool. Okay, and just to follow up on that, so is there, are there any partnerships with the pre-K programs where those children are leaving some of the early childhood pre-K programs and families are looking for the next place to go and looking for somewhere where their maybe siblings could be, maybe children could be there for a several years versus one or two years? Brandon, you wanna to speak to your um, recruitment efforts there? I'm sorry, I was on mute. What was the question? How, what kind of recruiting have you done at the preschool pre -K programs and preschools in the area such that they might um, want to enter our kindergarten program? I, if, is that correct? Does that reframe your question effectively? Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, just working with families in the, at the pre-K age range is sometimes they're either overwhelmed with options for kindergarten or they don't know any. 
So, and usually with families, it's, it's usually one or the other. They usually don't fall in between. And I know families who, when they go in um, for the lottery, they're overwhelmed with options. So they just check as many as they can check and may not even know about all those options, but they're just hoping that they can get in somewhere. But um, I'm just wondering in general, how, how much do families know? Like what, what do they know? Um, just information that's out there for families so that when they are making those choices that they know that the Children's Guild is an, is an option for them. Yeah, so when we're out in the communities, um, marketing to the to the pre-Ks, that's part of our marketing strategy. Um, again, we weren't able to do so this year. Uh, a lot of our competition does offer pre-K. So that's just something that, you know, we have to continue to work against. But um, that's that's a huge part of, of what we do during the during the normal school year. Um, I'm sorry, without without the pandemic, of course, but uh, again, our our school it caters to um, a certain type of student, and you know you just got to ask yourself, am I sending my child to uh, the Children's Guild at kindergarten if these issues haven't been um, identified as 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 being an issue? You mean because we do serve a lot of special needs kids? Yeah, right. you know, we're, we're and that's part of our rebranding effort. You know, this is the unique situation. When you have a general ed school that offers inclusion for students with disabilities, that's a very attractive model for parents of students with disabilities who want their children to be exposed to non-disabled peers. Our school is viewed as a special ed school and there's far less of an appetite for a parent of a non-disabled student who want to attend a school that's predominantly students with disabilities. They don't see the advantage to that for their child. And frankly, parents make decisions about their child um, in isolation of any other um, kind of decision. So that's, that's, we've come to realize that that's um, a challenging marketing um, 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 element for us and why we need to really analyze and potentially rebrand what who we are and what we can deliver so that it's more attractive to both general ed and, and special ed families. Um, but the families do know that you're if you're in the alternative accountability framework that you cater to students who are non-traditional learners who may not be successful in traditional schools. And it may be the argument why we're the only K to five, you know, K to eight, you know, school that's in the alternative framework. Because by middle and high school, parents and students are well aware of their kids' capacity to be successful in a general education environment. And you know, year after year of failure and lack of success and being put out or pushed out or made to feel not welcome or not experiencing success makes parents uh, at the middle and high school level much more um, of an appetite to pursue an alternative school. If your child's just entering kindergarten and they don't have an identified disability of a fairly significant nature, you're not looking for an alternative school and I think that makes our marketing strategy very challenging and why we need to really look at that. If that makes sense. So, yeah, that's, we don't, I think that's, uh, I'm glad you're raising these issues because it's an important discussion. And um, that's the conundrum we're in, but I know that there's an answer. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, but yeah, I know yeah. there is one. Yep. So, so we, um, so I think we'll you'll um, find the work, the work group, particularly on 
who's our population to be a interesting and challenging uh, exercise. And again, a great way that you can contribute. Um, and we'll do the best we can to provide sort of options and ideas and things that will uh, assist you in your, your thinking and help you also in your research um, and other ways you might want to think about this. But with, we're pretty much out of, out of time. It's 8.02. So I'd like to let you go uh, at the regular time. And again, I want to thank you, Rob, for throwing your hat in the ring. I think we're going to be off and running and we're going to be a different group here. And uh, I'd say uh, by the first of the year. So thank you all for participating and we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Um,